I am speaking this time around on the voice of God's election. The voice of God's election. The voice of God's election. Now I want to explain election with the political elections that we have across the countries. Recently in Nigeria, in the eastern part of Nigeria, a governor was elected to remain as governor. And the sitting governor was elected. People came out and voted. And then at the end of the day, they counted the votes and the man had more number of votes than the rest of the people that were competing. And so it was concluded that, that he had been re-elected into the governorship position. That's election. Everywhere in the world, they do election to select the president or members of the House of Rep or whatever name they call it in their own countries. So, also, God has election. Now, I want you to uh, take note as I make this distinction. There is nothing like election, pre-salvation, whatever. That is, God has earmarked this person will be saved this person will never be saved. This is a person that I want to, to come to heaven. This is a person that I want that you should follow Jesus. I don't want this person. I don't want the other person. There is nothing like that. There is uh, no predestination. Predestination that shows that God has elected somebody and then rejected somebody is making God unrighteous. Any interpretation of scriptures, listen to this attentively, any interpretation of scriptures that makes God unrighteous is a wrong interpretation. Predestination does not have to do with salvation. Now, but God has predestination, that is election. Election of somebody into service. When it comes to service, God has the prerogative to elect whomsoever he wants to elect. And so, we are talking about the voice of God's election. Now, I want to go into previous elections that God made in the midst of human beings. So, as to help us to understand what we are talking about. First, we are going to talk about the election of Isaac instead of any other person. Election of Isaac. He has said to Abraham, out of you will I make a nation. And then he had he had marked a person that that person Abraham was going to have. He had given Abraham that promise at the age of 75. And then at the age of almost 100 years, that promise came to pass, 25 long years after. But now the wife of Abraham, Sarai, now was impatient at a point in time and then met Abraham to get into a wrong arrangement. And now somebody by the name of Ishmael was born. But now that was not God's election. That was not God's mind. And God will not have anything to do with that because that was not his mind. God had already earmarked somebody called Isaac that was going to come out of the womb of Sarai. Now, in Romans chapter 9, and we're reading from verse 7. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham, are there all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. Verse 8, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, that is, the children of that bondwoman, descendants of that bondwoman, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. So God made an election of Isaac and does it. Now in Genesis chapter 21 and verse 12, we read this account. Genesis chapter 21 
and verse 12. He says, And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the Lord, that is, because of Ishmael. Let's see what happened from verse 8. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, that is the firstborn, Ishmael, which he had born unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son, Ishmael. And God said unto Abraham, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. In all that Sarah had said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Listen to me attentively. He has said unto Abraham that in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. But he had, he had marked a particular person that was going to come out of the loins of Abraham. And so it was Isaac. Abraham begat Isaac. Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob begat the 12 brethren. And from the 12 brethren, you have the expansion. And then from the lineage of one of those uh, brethren, Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman, came. So that is that. The matter of election, God chooses whom he wants to choose. It is his prerogative to choose whomsoever he wants to choose as far as service is concerned. Now come to the case of Jacob. Jacob was uh, the twin brother of Esau. But in the matter of service, God elected the younger. He came out later. God elected Jacob. He will have looked into the two children. The Bible says that even before they were born, before they knew left from right, before they knew evil from good, the election was made. You ask me why? God had looked into the nature of the people and seen the person that carries the nature that he was going to use and saw that nature in Jacob. And then he said, Jacob, have I preferred to Esau? When you hear that word written in the Bible, Jacob, have I loved Esau, have I hated? He simply was talking about preference, election. It's not talking about hatred in the sense that we know it. In Genesis chapter 25, we're reading verse 23. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb. And two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people. And the elder shall serve the younger. That is God's election. You don't question it. It is like you make an election to use one of the rooms in the house that you have built as a study. As your library, no person has the right to ask you why. You make an election to use one of the pairs of the shoes that you have to attend a wedding. No person has the right to ask you why. It is your prerogative. You find that fanciful, and so you chose it, even from among your pairs of shoes. So that is how it is. Now in Malachi, we're reading chapter 1. Let's read from verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, said the Lord. Yet he said, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, said the Lord? Yet I love Jacob. And I hated Esau. I led these mountains and his heritage west for the dragons of the wilderness. I preferred Jacob to Esau. Now let's make do with uh, the much that we have shown concerning the election of Jacob instead of Esau. Now 
We have a God electing Joseph in the midst of his brethren. Joseph being elected in the midst of his brethren is another incident of election. And nobody should question that. In Genesis chapter 37, we read Genesis chapter 37. We read the story. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob, the history, the genealogy. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zippah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. What do you mean by a coat of many colors? It is stated that the coat of many colors that Joseph received from his father presented a marked contrast to the plenar tonics worn by his brothers. It represented a position of special favoritism and honor with um, his father. Now, his father might not know what he was doing, but he was doing something prophetic. God had already elected the young person, the second to the last of the people, of the children, because of what he found in him, the singleness of mind, the righteousness of his mind, and how that he would not identify with every love righteousness and hated iniquity. So he was elected. And how do we know that God elected him? Let's go and read in verse 5. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding chiefs in the field, and lo, my sheep arose, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheep stood round about and made obeisance to my sheep. And that was what was coming, which eventually came to pass in Egypt. And then his brethren said unto him, Shall thou indeed reign over us? Yes, he eventually reigned over them. Or shall thou indeed have dominion over us? And yes, eventually he had dominion over them. And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his ways. Verse 9, and he dreamed yet another dream and told his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. Now, the sun representing his father, the moon representing his mother, and the eleven stars representing his brothers made obeisance unto him. That was the election of God, because God must raise a nation that will be in Egypt, and then from that Egypt, he will bring them out to the land that he had promised Abraham that his seed would inherit. So we find how that out of the children of Jacob, Joseph was elected. Now, think about the apostles of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came in, and before you knew it, he began to elect the people that were going to walk with him, the people that were going to serve him, the people that were going to be his apostles, the people that were going to be the arrowheads, the people that were going to be the foundation men, the people that were going to continue in the business, to occupy in the business until he came again. The people that would run the next lap of the relay race. He ran the first lap. And now the apostles ran the second lap. And then passed the button on to the other people, and to the other people, and then to other people. So he elected whom he wanted to elect. He saw them and elected them. 
And then he saw things inside them prior to the election. Uh, for instance, he saw that Peter was a bold person. And then he elected him and named him Peter, which means a stone. The sons of Zebedee he nicknamed the sons of thunder because he had seen what was in them. Now, you see that he made mention of the election when he was talking to them later on, before his departure. In John's Gospel, chapter 15, and we are reading verse 16. John 15 and verse 16. You have not chosen me, you have not elected me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. And then in chapter 6 of John's Gospel and verse 70, we have this statement of his. Chapter 6 and verse 70. He said, Jesus answered them, Have I not chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. The apostles were chosen from among the people of their day in order to run with him, in order to carry out the business he came with, with him. Now, we also find that Apostle Paul also was elected at a point in time. He was not among the apostles when Jesus Christ came, but God had pinpointed him. He had known him originally. He had seen the vision. He had seen the zeal in him, the zeal that he had toward his Judaism. And now that he was a Pharisee of the highest order, and then was keeping the law of, uh, of uh, Moses perfectly. He wasn't uh, uh, a hypocritical Pharisee. He said concerning Phariseeism, concerning keeping the law of Moses, he was blameless. And so when Jesus Christ came with this gospel that was uh, to replace uh, Judaism, now, this man would take none of that. And so, he would pursue every person that had anything to do with that Jesus, anything that had to do with that Christianity, because of the zeal he had the, toward the Jewish religion, Judaism. And God saw all that. And God knew very well that if he now turned him around, and showed him the superiority of the gospel to Judaism that he will put all his life. And that's what he did. And then God did the election. And here is his testimony when he was talking to the Galatians. Galatians chapter 1. Let's read from verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my conversation, that is manner of life, my conduct, in times past in the Jewish religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and I profited in the Jewish religion above many my equals in my own nation being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, when it pleased him to reveal, verse 16, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the hidden, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, God had known him even before he was born. God had elected him before he was born. Remember John the Baptist. The same thing is of John the Baptist. In Malachi chapter 3, and let's read 
verse 1. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, said the Lord of hosts. Talking about the coming of John the Baptist, whom God has already ordained. And in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 7, And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, who went he out into the wilderness to see a reed shaken with the wind. But what went you out for to see a man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out for to see a prophet? Yea, I say unto you, I'm more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. And uh, this person was known even before he was formed in his mother's womb. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. And we are reading verse 76. And thou shalt shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his way. So John the Baptist was elected from his mother's womb and was even filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. Now I want to show also that the priests of old, were elected from among men. The priests of old were elected from among men. And we have this record in Hebrews chapter 5. And let's read Hebrews chapter 5. Reading from verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things concerning God, things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. All the five priests of old were taken from among men. Aaron was taken from among men, among other people in his tribe. And so also were other high priests taken from among the people. It was God's election. The person speaking with you sought to know the Lord when I was nine years old. And on a particular day, I wept my heart out, seeking to know the Lord, seeking to know about life after death, seeking to know about heaven, seeking to know about soul and spirit. But there was no way I could know it because there was nobody around to tell me. And I consoled myself, and the quest died as it were. But after the civil war in Nigeria, the quest rose again, and I began to seek to know the Lord. And in February 1975, I gave my life to Jesus Christ, repented of my sins, and became genuinely regenerated. Let me branch a little to ask you that are listening to me, have you been genuinely regenerated? What is your testimony concerning regeneration? Some people tell us when I came to Watchman 19 something, I came to Watchman 2002 and so what? You come to Watchman, is that a testimony? That just that you came to a church. We are talking about, did you give your life to Christ? Did you repent of sin? Did you seek the Lord? Is there any regeneration that was done in your life by the Spirit of God? And so, come back to what I was saying. After that regeneration, I was born and bred in the Roman Catholic institution. And that is where I spent all my young life, serving at mass 
and then being religious. And then when I became born again, now I had the opportunity to go to some other existing Pentecostal or evangelical churches that were there and then be part of them, hear the word of God, join in the workers' squad, and then live my life as a Christian and die and go to heaven. But God somehow I made me to, to have my, my mind stuck onto these people from where I had been all my life. And then I began to seek how to help in the midst of them. I didn't know that I was going to be a pastor. I didn't begin for one. I didn't want to be a leader. I didn't want to be a pastor. I wanted to do whatsoever that I needed to do. If it was prayer, let me pray. If it was writing a tract, let me write. Whatever small thing that I could do, let me do it, providing that that thing will influence anybody that read it, anybody that had it, into believing in Christ, into repenting of sin. And so, now, I didn't know that God had ordained me for something until I moved me from a place that I was enjoying my life as a believer and having a nice job and moved me back to Lagos and moved me into a parish, or into the parish of a place where the, the parish priest had been my friend and then told me that he was going to do something there. That is how the whole thing began. And when I went into that place, there was no single person that was born again. I didn't bring this person that was born again, bring this person that was born again, bring the other person that was born again and said, let us float a church. There was no such thing. I was just there until God gave opportunity for me to preach unto the people. And then I began to preach and the people became born again. And when a number of them became born again, persecution arose. And then we were driven out from the church. And then we couldn't stop having fellowship. And that is how the whole thing began. I didn't know what it was going to transform into until as time went on, I began to hear the voice of the Lord. Until as time went on, I began to hear the voice of the Lord saying, I will bring into that for which I've called thee and that without measure. And then until we began to see and hear all the things that he's saying, the things that we hear, uh, which we are rehearsing every now and again in Isaiah chapter 49, 5 and 6, and now say, the Lord has formed me from the womb to be a servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. And he said, it's a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give you for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation to the end of the earth. Now, this is election. Even before I knew it, before, he said, before I was formed in my mother's womb, just like a Jeremiah was called before he was formed in his mother's womb. And so, we are saying that God's election is speaking volumes. The voice is the voice of many waters. The voice of a tsunami. The voice of the oceans put together. And they are raging. That is what the election of God is speaking. That is the, that is the loudness of the election of God speaking in favor of the watchman. So, you are there. And then you hear all these things, then why is it that you are halting between two opinions? Why is it that you are living your life that is a militating, a life that is militating against the ministry? Why is this so? If you continue to do like that, my friend, you are running into collision course with the law. The intention of the series is to show that there are many voices that are speaking in favor of the watchman. And as a result, the watchman is indestructible. The watchman is unroutable. The watchman is insurmountable. 
the voice of election by the Almighty God. It's not election by men. It was not election by men. They gather together and then vote as to who should be the generous pretender, as to who should be this and that. It is not an election by a number of people that got, uh, got offended in the place where they are and gathered together and decided to run a congregation. That is not about watchman. The watchman is an entity elected by God, like Jacob was elected by God instead of Esau, like Isaac was elected by God instead of uh, uh, Ishmael, Joseph was elected by God instead of his other brethren, and the apostles were elected by Jesus Christ instead of the numerous people. I have told you that election is for service. And God has elected the watchman for service. And that service, he will ensure that that service is executed. That service is done. He has elected the watchman for a particular objective, for a particular goal. And that goal he must achieve. Nothing will prevent him from achieving it. I did not uh, sit on a conference table and suggested to him, let's do this one, let's do the other one. This is the truth of the living God. And so, I want to close with this uh, portion of scriptures in Ephesians chapter 4, so that those of you that are there, you should be adjusting your mind day after day as you are hearing these things. That is the intention of the word that is coming to you. Ephesians chapter 4. We are reading from verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when he, Jesus Christ, ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now he that ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that has descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might feel all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. For what purpose? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for a defying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men, and cunning craftiness whereby the lie in wait to deceive. Now, you have already heard concerning the times in which we are, the times of false teachers and prophets, the times of fanciful things, the times of putting the scriptures on its head, the head downwards and the legs upward. And then doing that, and it is working because it is uh, agreeing to sensual uh, interests that the people have. Now, the scriptures, they interpret the scriptures this time around, and uh, the way they interpret it makes a scene no more to be sinful. That's the time we are into. And then many people are rushing because they are not seeking heaven, because they are not seeking righteousness. And so, at such times, you need to be stabilized, not to be dancing around, tossed about with every wind of doctrine, just like a piece of a dry leaf is carried up by the wind or the wild wind, and then is tossing it this way and tossing it that way. My close with this piece of information. I've told you numerously that the people that can be considered unfortunate in church 
are the people that did not accept to be taught and to be cleansed. The people that came into church claimed to have been born again, but they refused to be taught and to be cleansed. Two things. To be taught and to be cleansed. Such people remain there after 30 years. Something begins to manifest in their lives. And then you begin to know that they are not really genuine brethren. They may have grown into workers. They may have grown into leaders. They may have grown into women, uh, leaders, and so on and so forth. It's immaterial. And then you know that without being taught and being cleansed, no person can make the rapture. Let me give you an illustration. The Lord Jesus Christ came and then elected these people. He had a vision. He had a mission that he wanted to pass onto them. He had an objective. He had a, a commission that he wanted to pass onto them. But he couldn't readily pass the thing onto them until he had taught them, until they were clean from all the nasty natural tendencies of the natural man. And when that was done, now he said in John's Gospel, chapter 15 and verse 3, now ye are clean through the words that I have spoken to you. You can now go and occupy till I come back. So seek to be cleansed. Seek to be taught. And you cannot be cleansed unless you are taught. Now it is time for us to rise up in prayer. And your prayer shall be, Lord, I can see. Election of God. Election of God is the way of God. Election for service. I can see how God elected people in times past. What else am I waiting for? Are there not evidences? There are evidences. And if you know that there are evidences, why not agree with the evidences and then pray to the Lord? 